Hi everyone, I'm Reza. This is the third tutorial video of Prism Spasticity. This video will go over the input files required for Prism Spasticity. I assume you have watched the last two videos, so you have your DIL2 and Prism Spasticity compiled already. To start with, as I mentioned in the last video, you need to inform your Ubuntu that you have already installed DIL2. So we use these two commands to do that. So in the next step, we want to git clone plasticity again. So it's git clone https github prism center plasticity.git. After you clone the prism plasticity, we can compile it again. It will not take that much time. So we cd to plasticity folder. So you can see all the folders here so first we do cmake dot so here we want to use eight processors for the making so we use this command make dash j eight after you get this done then you need to go to the folder applications and within that you need to go to crystal plasticity and do cmake dot and finally you need to do make release so we go for make release. It will give you the executive for Prism Spasticity CPFE Find Element simulations. So now let's actually dig into the input files we require for Prism Spasticity applications. Let's go to the folder FCC. Let's go to the folder compression. So let's see what type of files do we have here. We have boundary condition info.txt, we have latent hardening ratio.txt, grain id.txt, orientations.txt, prm.prm, sleep direction.txt, and sleep normals.txt. So what are the meaning of each one of these files? So let's start with boundary condition info.txt. Let's open it. So boundary condition typically include the information for the type of applied boundary condition you want to have. So I will go over the details of this file later, but this is typically how boundary condition, the simplest form look like. So the second file latent hardening ratio is basically a matrix which the components are the latent hardening for each sleep system and their interaction. So let's open latent hardening ratio. So you can see it's like a matrix with bunch of numbers that these are basically latent hardening for each sleep system and their interactions with other sleep systems. So the third file is grain ID. If you open grain ID, you'll see there is a file with bunch of integer number. So here we are using a voxelized information to inform the CPFE simulation what grain IDs are related to each voxel. So how it works is you have a voxelized grain ID which discretizes your sample and it says each of these voxels what are the grain ID for that. And here typically you define what are the size of this voxel information. In this case it's 32 by 32 by 32 and we'll go over the detail how this in XYZ will be arranged here. The next file is orientation. So for each of those number you sign the grain ID there is an orientation with respect to that. So here for the first one there is a three components of Rodriguez vector. So the orientation file is actually described in Rodriguez vector. If you go all the way to the end of the file there are only 346 grain and this file will provide the information for each of those grains. So let's go over the last two files. As you may tell from the name of these two files, sleep directions, sleep normals, these include crystallographic information of sleep systems in the Cartesian coordinate system. Each of those should have number of rows equal to number of sleep systems. For example, in the FCC system we have 12 sleep systems and if you open one of these you can see that there are 12 rows. The last but the most important file is prm.prm. The reason that we are naming this file with the extension of .prm is because DIL2 version 9.2 explicitly states that if you want to read the input file from a specific procedure, you need to have the extension of .prm. So that's the reason we named this file like this. So let's open this file.
This file pretty much includes many of those information that you need to define as a CPFE simulation. So let's start going one by one and see what does each of these lines mean. So let's go over this file line by line and explain what's the meaning of each line. So the first line is set order of finite elements. So here you define if you want to have the linear finite element, quadratic finite element. So it's like having a linear hex second order order hex it's like that but the second one it's actually defining the order of numerical integration so for example in the case of linear elements the number of integration point the order of integration point you need to have to precisely integrate the finite element formulation is two in the next line it defines the set number of dimensions which is three so you should be careful cpfe framework in prism spasticity only support three dimensional simulation so the next three lines are domain size in X, Y, and Z. So for now, we are just providing the information for cube element. But if you have any other geometry, you simply can modify a simple file to include that geometry, which is basically following the deal to information. In the next step, we want to go over the discretization properties. So the first three lines, subdivisions X, Y, and Z, are dividing the unit cell that you have in the x y and z directions they're pretty intuitive so if you want to have three by three by three file element mesh you just substitute this one with three in the x y and z direction but the last one that refine factor means the number of refinement you will have for each unit element for example if you have the numbers let's say three here three here and three here this will make a three by three by three discretized which is in total 27 but if you don't want to further refine it you just put zero here it means that you have in total 27 elements but if you make it one it means that each of those coarse elements will be refined one times in each direction so for example each element will become eight elements so in total you will have 24 by 24 by 24 mesh discretization you should be careful that it's always more efficient to use the set refine factor to refine the mesh rather than using the subdivisions in the x y and z directions also if you want to import external mesh there is a line that you need to add which is set use external mesh to true if you don't define that it means that it will automatically consider that you don't have any external mesh so the next line you need to define is the name of the external mesh so you will say set name of file containing external mesh for example the name is 123.txt and the last one is a ratio of the defined region size to the domain size for example set external mesh parameter to in my case I just put 0.5 so when an external mesh is read the x y and z positions are not precisely defined Defined and it has some round of errors. This matter in the case of boundary conditions assignment. Accordingly, a margin is defined here in which if a point is located in this margin around the boundary condition, it will be considered as a boundary condition degree of freedom or points. The size of this region in each direction is external mesh parameter times domain size in that direction. You can read the tutorial for that if you have any questions. Since we don't want to have any external mesh we just delete all this from the input files the next line is solver output parameters so this one if you set it as false it will not print out VTU and PVTU file for you which include the updated deformation or degrees of freedom or the type of output you want to print out like the local stress or local strain in the next line you basically define the name of the folder you want to have all all your results inside that folder which I put it results
defaults here if you didn't create already this folder the code will automatically generate it for you the next line is set skip output steps equal to 50 this means that every 50 time step the code will generate results for you so the next line set output equivalent strain stress grain ID and twin fraction if you have any twinning enabled defines which of these local fields you want to print out if this set right output is true one important point that you need to be careful is how you can actually modify the outputs you want to print out this is a little bit advanced for now but we'll go over it later so the next line is set boundary condition file name so here boundary condition info.txt was the file I showed you earlier is the file that defines what type of boundary condition you want to apply to that cube so the next line set boundary condition file number of header lines it defines the number of header lines you have in your boundary condition input file and finally set number of boundary conditions equal to four means that there are four types of boundary conditions you're applying on your sample so let's go back to the boundary condition info.txt file so if you open boundary condition info.txt besides those two header lines that you define there are three different columns so the first column is the face ID number that you're applying the boundary condition the second column is the degree of freedom that you are applying boundary condition on that specific face and the column number three is the final displacement that you're applying at that specific face so you can find the convention for face ID and degrees of freedom for prism spasticity inside the user manual for example if you go to Google and just say prisms github and then open that go to plasticity and go to docs and then to user manual you'll find all the information for the input files that I just went over and here you can find the convention for boundary conditions the face numbering and the degrees of freedom so let's go back to the input file so the next line is time increment and the one after that is total time so how does it work basically says that for example in this case the total time is five so if you go back to the boundary condition file you can see that there are three applied boundary conditions on phase one and there is one on phase two phase one is the one with the normal in the x direction with the yz plane and number one is in the negative side and number two is in the positive side on the phase one degrees of freedom one two three are fixed if you can see that degrees of freedom is one two three and the final displacements are zero so you basically fix one side and then you're applying minus 0 0.05 on the other side which is compression in the direction of one so it's pretty much something like this so you're applying the load in the x direction the compression load while you're fixing the other face in all three directions so this one two three on phase one this is phase one and you're uh, you're fixing it in all three direction while you're applying on phase two in degrees of freedom one which is x direction the compression so that's how we define the displacement here that compressive displacement minus 0 0.05 will be applied on the sample within five unit time this unit time can be second millisecond whatever you want to define but it should be consistent throughout the input file so this input file doesn't have any unit but you need to keep on some specific unit system and you should keep it throughout the simulation you cannot for example define total time in millisecond and time increment in second so the time increment is defined based on the total time and it means here we are simulating because the sample dimension is one we are applying minus 0 0.05 which is minus five percent which is five percent in compression so what are the next two lines so here in the find element solver we are solving the equation ku equal to f which is a set of equations so for that in the large system we are doing that iteratively so here it defines what's the maximum number of iterations you're going through to solve that and here it's the linear solver tolerance which how much your residual should be so that the equation is considered as solved but be careful this number linear solver tolerance has a relation with the sample size so if your sample size is too large or is too small you cannot use the same number you should be careful about it it should be small enough so you can actually solve the sample because if you are artificially putting a very large number it can be solved in 
one iteration, but it means that the residual is very high and you didn't actually solve the linear equations. The next line, maximum number of nonlinear iterations, it defines the number of nonlinear iteration we are going through to solve the Newton Raphson equation for nonlinear constitutive model we are using for crystal plasticity. Be careful, if you define your algorithmic tangent modulus very precise, then you should get very good convergency within three, four, or five tops nonlinear iteration. Here in this prism plasticity software, we derived the algorithmic tangent modulus in a way that it can easily get converged within three or four nonlinear iterations. So the next six lines are the elastic modulus of the system. So it, it's six by six, and here I define them in megapascal, but as I explained you before, you just need to be careful about the unit consistency. The next line is number of sleep systems. Here we have an FCC system, so it's 12 sleep systems. The next line, set latent hardening ratio file name, defines the name of the file, which include the latent hardening ratios matrix. So the next four lines introduce the crystal plasticity model parameters. For example, the first one is initial slip resistance, the next one is hardening modulus, power law exponent, and saturation stress. And the next two lines introduce sleep direction and sleep normal file names. Here in the rate independent model, there is a stress tolerance for convergency, which 10 to power minus 6 to 10 to power minus 9 are really good numbers for this simulation. This number will be useless for rate dependent plasticity. The next two lines are maximum sleep search iterations and maximum solver iterations. These are some advanced feature of the model. You can just leave them as one. And here we go. The macrostructure. As I explained to you when I was talking about grain ID file, here you need to define the dimensions of your grain ID file. Here as I showed you before, we were using 32 by 32 by 32 macrostructure, voxelized macrostructure. And here is the name of the file, grain ID. And here is the number of header lines you had before the actual grain ID numbering star. The next line is set orientation file name, which is the orientations. So in this session, we briefly went over the most simplest input files we will have for an FCC system. In the next video, we actually will simulate this file for the same example and post-process the results to see how does it look like. Thank you very much for your attention.